For our first roundtable in this series, Conversations on Cancel Culture, we wanted to start with journalism, which is the foundation of any free society. We have many, many examples of journalists around the world being pressured or punished, and sometimes not even for their journalism, but sometimes it's just it's for their actions elsewhere. And there's a very broad range of consequences that we can discuss whether it's the New York Times op-ed page editor, James Bennett, losing his job after publishing a column by Republican Senator Tom Cotton that was controversial, or the young black editor of Teen Vogue losing her position for comments she made on social media as a teenager about Asian people. And we wanna talk about how real life violence can impact journalists' ability to do their work. Um, we're very honored to have an extremely distinguished panel of journalists and uh, cartoonists and uh, people who work in journalism in various ways and who are impacted by this issue to join us today. So let's start with our panelists and then we'll get into the issues. Susie Bunny Karam is the former head of global news gathering and an executive vice president at Vice News. Before that, she was the editorial director of Gizmodo Media Group, and before that, the first filmmaker in residence at Harvard University's Shorenstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy, where she directed and produced the documentary Enemies of the People, Trump, and the Political Press. Danielle Belton is the editor in chief of HuffPost, the newly minted editor-in-chief of HuffPost, I should say. Before that, she was the editor-in-chief of the leading black interest news site, The Root. Before joining The Root, Danielle was editor-at-large for the black women news site, Clutch Magazine Online, and was the first black woman to lead a writer's room in late night as the head writer for BET Network's NAACP Image Awards no um, nominated talk show, Don't Sleep. Gerard Biard, joining us from Paris, is the editor-in-chief of the satirical French news magazine, Charlie Hebdo. Gerard has been associated with Charlie Hebdo since 1992, when it was relaunched after a 10-year hiatus. He was in London for a conference when Charlie Hebdo's Paris office was targeted in a January 2015 terrorist attack in which 12 people were tragically killed and 11 were injured. Finally, Daryl Cage is an editorial cartoonist and founder of the syndicate Kegel Cartoons, Inc. The syndicate distributes Daryl's work along with 10 columnists and about 70 of the world's top editorial cartoonists to over 700 subscribing newspapers, including half of America's daily paid circulation newspapers. He's also a past president of the National Cartoonist Society and the National Cartoonist Society Foundation. So welcome to all of you really accomplished people. Thank you for being here. <laughs> um, I think some of you guys are on mute, so I, I'm just gonna presume you all just said thank you very much for having me. Thank you. <laughs> you did. <laughs> <It's> terrific, <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, I, some, I, I know that we've asked to be on mute, but this is meant to be a, a conversation. And so I'm just gonna override that and just say when, when we, you wanna jump in, jump on in. So I, I've had the, pr the privilege of speaking with uh, most of you before we started this panel. And this is a topic that I've been very eager to get into, but also a little bit scared to get into because um, I, it's, it's a scary time for, for journalism in a lot of ways. And one of the things that keeps coming up is what actually is cancel culture? What, what does it mean to you? And um, Susie, I wanted like to start with you and just see if we can't come up with a definition of this kind of slightly toxic phrase at this point that we can you know, start the conversation with? Well, look, I think one of the problems with this whole sort of conversation around cancel culture is that the, the concept of canceling someone has really evolved in a way that's flattened what it means, right? So this, this concept sort of started among communities of color. This really became sort of prevalent through black Twitter. And then over time, the term has been sort of appropriated by people um, sort of in bad faith, right? To mean anything that um, they want it to mean, right? So the right, especially in America, the sort of right uses cancel culture to sort of describe this kind of moral panic, right? This idea that, you know, everything is being canceled and, um, you know, everyone has to be careful what they say 
On the other hand, the right is also, you know, pulling Liz Cheney from her leadership position, and they're not referring to that as canceling her, right? Because right. Like, literally she's losing a position. So I think part of the problem is, is that there's like two sort of separate things that are embedded in cancel culture. One is what it was intended to be, which was consequence culture, right? That there's certain accountability that people in power need to have, and that now, you know, because of social media and because there's more outlets to organize and show dissent, that, you know, people in power now face more consequences. And then there's something else, which is sort of this outrage culture, which is a different sort of thing that goes on, right? Which is just this kind of jumping on the bandwagon and getting really mad at someone for something that feels a bit inconsequential or someone who doesn't really have a lot of power, right? And I think we need to kind of separate those two things and talk about them separately because part of the problem is that nobody really knows what they're talking about when they talk about cancel culture. Well, you had a pretty good definition when you and I were speaking earlier. You you called it, it to, you said, to me, it feels like the weaponized silencing of progressive thinking. That was what you said. I thought that was pretty good, although I, I'm not sure it only applies to progressive thinking, to your to your point about Liz Cheney and, and other people who, you know, might be canceled, so to speak. Right. Uh, Danielle, you also had an interesting perspective on what is how to define this term, which I do agree is being distorted and and, and misappropriated. And, and we should talk about what we mean when we're talking about it in this conversation. Sure. So, like, I totally agree with Susie. I feel like the phrase has like lost all sense of its original intention. Mm. Um, you know, for me the idea of someone being canceled was about holding people in positions of power who had done bad things, you know, responsible. The idea that if you have harmed people, um, if you're an abuser, if you're a racist, if you've actually done things that, you know, negatively impact people's lives, you know, maybe you don't deserve the position that you have, and you know, to give your opinion in this particular way. Um, and so that has always been the way that I saw it. Uh, seeing it kind of like twisted and distorted and doing this thing, this thing now where it's just like, just going after people for speaking out about, just about anything now um, is very different. And isn't, it has nothing to do with cancel culture. It's something that's always existed in American society. Um, I have dealt with hate mail from white supremacist groups since I was like 18 or 19 years old uh, when I was editor in chief of my college newspaper. This is just built into the fabric of American society. And I think we need to, to differentiate between just a bunch of like noise on the internet when people just like get their, you know, so to speak, panties in a bunch and want to go in on somebody and crack jokes is very different from the potential violence of extremism. You know, and mm -hmm. so I think it's important to separate the two from each other because those are two entirely different conversations. You know, the times that I've been quote unquote dragged you know, on Twitter um, mm. over my opinion, you know, it was like, it was, you know, it like, yeah, it hurt my feelings, but that's all it did. You know, it didn't impact my life anything more than my feelings got hurt. And that was the consequence of me, like putting my opinion out there and then dealing with people who didn't agree with it. It's very different from, you know, the hate mail that I received from extremists who feel that I shouldn't have a voice as a black woman in American society. And mm. there's an implied violence that comes with that. There's a real fear that that extremism is going to turn to something much deeper and more dangerous. Because we have a history of it in this country of extremist violence, particularly against people on the left. So I feel like we have to be really careful about what exactly we're talking about. Because to me, there's a big difference, a huge difference between legitimate criticism, people who are just trolling, and things that could actually lead to the loss of life. Mm -hmm. Although it, it's difficult to decide to to figure out who's in charge of deciding, you know, <laughs> who's in what bucket. But um, Daryl, let me turn to you because uh, you represent this huge group of editorial uh, cartoonists, and you've experienced what you consider to be the effect of cancel culture on your work on the work of the art, the artists, the cartoonists that you represent. Can, can you share, share that with us? Well, we see it breaking down in, in two ways. Uh, the changes from editors being uh, 
less receptive to a broad range of views and uh, the aggressiveness of governments around the world um, harassing and terrorizing cartoonists. Just about half of the population of the world, well, more than half of the population of the world lives in a country where cartoonists are not allowed to draw their own leaders. Um, we have a cartoonist in our You said draw their group. own leaders, meaning drawing like the, the, president the presidents the of their country. You don't see cartoonists in China drawing Xi Jinping. Mm. You never saw a cartoonist right. in Cuba draw a Castro. We mm. have two cartoonists in Singapore who tell me, we're free to draw anything we want, Daryl. We just can't draw anything about Singapore. Um, <laughs> it's the nature of the world. Uh, you know, you can get thrown in jail for drawing a cartoon in India. It was a cartoonist in Bangladesh who uh, got out of jail about a month ago, tortured in prison for his cartoon about uh, uh, criticizing uh, Bangladesh's COVID response. He suffered permanent loss of hearing. Uh, oh, wow. In our own group, one of our cartoonists um, late last year was imprisoned for uh, drawing a cartoon critical of an Arab regime. Uh, one of our cartoonists in Venezuela, Ramos Soprani, uh, escaped from uh, harassment and threats from the Venezuelan regime, and she's drawing from Florida now. That's a is happy that is, story. is this is this uh, different from from just general uh, lack of freedom of speech in countries that are not democracies is that is 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 there do you see a distinction between what's happening today than maybe what has has always been the case well actually i think uh, editorial cartoonists are in much the same boat as journalists in general this is a terrible time and a dangerous time for journalists around the world and uh uh, editorial cartoonists are kind of the, the canaries in the coal mine of, of journalism. We are on the front lines and, uh, you know, regimes are especially intolerant of cartoons more than they are words. Um, it's, uh, our, our websites are under constant attack from what appears to be third world regimes. And uh, we're supported by this company Cloudflare and their project Galileo for small journalism sites that suffer from um, from outsized hacker attacks trying to take us down. Um, and sometimes they do take us down. Um, but, you know, it's not a criminal thing. There's no money to be made, no secrets to be released. What they want to do is erase our, our hard drives and our archives. This happened a couple of times. It's a constant wow. battle. That didn't used to exist. Um, the nature of the response to editorial cartoons has evolved uh, into the typical response we get are from people who are offended, who want to uh, somehow punish the artist who offended them. They come to me because I'm perceived to be the guy who can fire a cartoonist. They, uh, they uh, want an apology and they want the cartoon to be removed. Um, and uh, these come from different interest groups, but there's a, you know, there's a, a commonality to them. Um, but you know, the, the, the issues with the cartoonists around the world is just, it's just a horror. And uh, we have a cartoonist in Slovakia who was sued by the prime minister of Slovakia. That's an EU country, supposed to have a free press. And he sued because the prime minister had his feelings hurt by the cartoon, went to the Supreme Court and mm -hmm. it was found in the cartoonist's favor. But that's not really the point. These lawsuits are intended to chill cartoonist speech and to be very expensive so that uh, you, you know, the cartoonist thinks twice about criticizing someone in power. Uh, a friend of mine, Ali Dilem in Algeria, draws for the Liberté newspaper. He tells me he's always got a handful of, of lawsuits active from uh, government officials who were uh, somehow uh, bothered by his cartoons. Um, now, on the other hand, here in America, I'm quite safe. And uh, <laughs> I... Uh, I suffer a different kind of a, an issue with cancel culture, which is the the attitudes of editors. And there are all kinds of examples of difficult cancel culture for cartoons here. For example, just about uh, two months ago, we saw an, uh, a situation I'd never seen before where an entire newspaper chain, Gannett, canceled comic strip Mallard Film or conservative comic strip uh, across all of their newspapers at the corporate level. It's never happened before. Uh, typically, what was what was the reason editors, for that? What was the reason for that? 
they didn't give it a reason, but at the time there was blowback about uh, some uh, what I think were uh, vile uh, transgender bashing in Mellard Fillmore. And uh, that is something that we're seeing from the conservative cartoonists. I've killed a couple of transgender bashing cartoons myself. I've, I've actually become more, uh, more active in killing cartoons than I had in the past, which is something hmm. I'm not happy about, but I, I am. I killed a couple of uh, Dominion voting system uh, accused of fraud cartoons. Uh, typically in the past, I would kill cartoons that were too sexually explicit. Um, you know, uh, editorial cartoons are uh, a part of state mandated AP history testing in eighth and 11th grade. So we have a lot of high school and middle school readers and I need to keep the cartoons um, middle school safe. Uh, right. You know, we, we sell to the, the tests for uh, uh, the schools and we sell to the textbooks that teach to the tests. Uh, mm. A common email I get is, Dear Mr. Cagle, please explain the cartoon to me. My paper's due tomorrow. Um, <laughs> in that respect, uh, you know, my French cartoon colleagues think of American cartoonists as prudes. And, uh, you know, they're kind of right. They can get away with drawing things that uh, we just can't get but editors to even you consider. Were, you were pointing out to me that, that, that you found that newspaper editors had been shying away from criticism of Trump during the Trump administration. And that, that you thought that was a certain chilling of of a, a willingness to enter into kind of topics that would provoke. Well, keep in mind, we've got just about half of America's daily newspapers that subscribe to our service. There's mm -hmm. about 1400 daily newspapers in America. We've got about 700 and about 200 more internationally or not defined as newspapers. And we keep uh, good statistics on what cartoons the editors choose to publish. So from us, from our 70 cartoonists, they're probably getting more than 20 cartoons a day to choose from. And they probably also subscribe to one of the competing syndicates and get another five to 10 cartoons. Um, so they have enough that they can choose whatever they are predisposed to choose. And we've noticed over the years that editors have been becoming more and more timid and rejecting uh, printing cartoons that uh, express opinions. And that, uh, because we collect stats on each of the cartoons and we can compare what the, mm -hmm. the usage is between different cartoons. Um, and there used to be a, a kind of a general consensus that uh, because most newspapers are in rural and suburban areas that tend to be conservative, that conservative cartoonists would be reprinted more and uh, you would see that in the newspapers, the conservative papers would run a conservative cartoon, the liberal papers would run both left and right, compare left and right, and um, it, it was a pretty stark difference. We've noticed that difference disappear. Both the liberal and the conservative papers are printing the same cartoons, which are cute little asides on topical uh, subjects that don't express an opinion. Um, during the Trump years, we saw this progress uh, to be cartoon uh, e editors choosing not to choose cartoons that feature Trump at all. So as Trump is dominating the news every day, and so many cartoonists are drawing Trump because that's where their passion is and that's where the news and the issues of the day are, the editors simply were not reprinting those cartoons. And uh, we saw the progress of printing cartoons at the beginning of the Trump administration going to the last year and a half, and those cartoons just being almost entirely ignored by editors, uh, mm. which was is shocking and very, very frustrating for cartoonists because, you know, we have a kind of a, a macho attitude among cartoonists. We want to uh, hit people on the head with our opinions. We want to speak truth to power. Uh, we, want to, we want to draw the most powerful cartoons that we can. And to come up against this uh, filter of editors filtering out all of this, all of the expressions of opinion and and just going with the, the cute little jokes, you know, uh, I've had my vaccination, now I can hug grandma. That's, uh, that's very frustrating for cartoonists. It goes mm -hmm. against the nature of what we wanna do and why we're in this profession. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Gerard, please, uh, we, we, we were all completely uh, devastated on your on behalf of what happened at Charlie Hebdo in 2015 and uh, feels like could have been yesterday. Can you tell us sort of what has been the impact of, on Charlie Hebdo and on speech in France in general, because obviously that's a message to all journalists. It's not just a message to Charlie Hebdo uh, and how you've continued to do your work in the, in the years after this attack. Alors, il y a deux choses dans votre question. C'est d'abord, comment nous, nous avons continué, nous avons continué à travailler euh, ça a été compliqué, euh, j'en ai beaucoup parlé, euh, d'autres euh, dans la rédaction ont aussi beaucoup parlé, mais il était hors de question pour nous euh, d'arrêter euh, Charlie Hebdo et d'arrêter de faire, euh, de dessiner et d'écrire comme nous l'avions toujours fait, euh, parce que c'était précisément euh, ce, que les, ce que les terroristes qui, euh, qui nous ont attaqué le 7 janvier euh, souhaitaient. Donc il est hors question, hors de question de leur donner raison. But let's get it. Let's get a translation from Timothy. For Charlie Hebdo, I would have, I would have, the, I would have the question to stop being Charlie Hebdo, of course, because that what, what that was the, the aim of the of the of the terrorists. So uh, the first the first thing was to keep doing the job and keep thinking, saying, drawing the the, the thing that they were used to do before. And the second part of the answer of Jia. Alors, le, 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 après, maintenant, il y a euh, ce qui a changé euh, au niveau de tous les autres, de tous les autres médias. Euh, il y a la peur du terrorisme, il y a la peur de, la, de, 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 de ce racket euh, terroriste qui, euh, qui voudrait nous imposer de ce que, ce que l'on doit dire et ce que l'on ne doit pas dire, ce que l'on doit dessiner, les sujets que l'on doit aborder. Euh, mais il y a aussi, euh, et là ça rejoint le, le débat que nous avons aujourd'hui, la conversation que nous avons aujourd'hui, il y a tout, toute cette, toute cette, euh, cette tendance euh, qui n'existait pas avant en France, euh, ce que, ce que l'on appelle donc la « cancel culture », euh, qui est quelque chose, euh, comme l'a dit Daniel Belton, euh, c'est quelque chose qui fait partie de la culture américaine. En France, c'est quelque chose qui nous, est, euh, qui nous était totalement inconnu jusqu'à jusqu jusqu aujourd'hui, euh, parce que euh, en, il, y a, il y a toujours eu de la censure en France, il y a toujours eu une censure, mais c'est une censure institutionnelle qui est organisée par l'État. Je vais peut-être... Yes. In all the other newspapers in France, uh, different from Charlie Hebdo, uh, which are not on the same uh, level of uh, of, uh, of issues, um, there is the same issue that the, the, the terrorists. Uh, there is a, a general fear of uh, being imposed uh, what to say, what to think, what to what to publish, uh, and of course everyone is is afraid about that, but they don't want to change their lines. So uh, on the issue of cancel culture, which is different from the terrorist uh, attacks. Of course, because we are talking about something more general, more uh, a general state of mind in, uh, in in the press and in the social media, for example. So um, this this is something different because in France, uh, the censorship basically was more institutional at the time um, when Charlie Hebdo was born uh, during uh, the first year, the first years of the of the of, of the current republic, and so uh, the the American culture, um, which which you talk about, uh, Daniel. Um, is very different, and in France, it's it's quite a new thing to have a, a new kind of censorship, which is not censorship uh, like we, we used to we used to think in the institutional way. So this is a, a different time, and um, the journalists have to adapt to what is going on right now uh, under the influence of the American culture, of course. But uh, but in general, uh, in society, and, and yeah, I'll let uh, Gérard uh, continue his uh, his words. Oui, c'est 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 une forme de pour, pour moi, c'est une forme de censure euh, qui ne dit pas son nom, euh, qui, est, qui est non plus euh, le, le fait d'institutions, de, 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 euh, d'institutions étatiques ou d'institutions religieuses, comme ça a toujours été le cas, euh, comme c'était le cas avant, 
mais euh, qui est le fait d'individus de, de, ou de groupes d'individus euh, qui sont bien souvent des militants, euh, qui agissent au nom d'idées tout à fait défendables, euh, au nom de l'antiracisme, au nom du féminisme, au nom de la défense des minorités, euh, tout cela est parfaitement, euh, parfaitement défendable et ce sont, des, ce sont des, des, des combats que nous menons aussi euh, depuis longtemps à Charlie Hebdo, depuis le début. Euh, simplement, ce sont des militants euh, très radicaux et qui s'organisent qui euh, avec, avec une arme qui est, qui est, qui est au fond très, très, euh, très nouvelle pour les rédactions, qui sont les réseaux sociaux. Euh, qui, euh, qui, donne, qui donne une idée totalement déformée euh, de, de l'opinion générale. Euh, quand le, 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 le... Yeah. So, um, when, when, when you talked about American culture, uh, so this is the new kind of censorship that we are saying now, now sorry, uh, which is not about institutions, but about group of people, individuals, uh, organized group of people uh, that are... Um, pushing uh, prog progressive ideas like uh, anti-racism, feminism, uh, minority defense of any kind of minorities, um, which is a, a, a topic that Charlie has always been uh, engaged in. Uh, they were in, in all that fight uh, since, uh, since its beginning. But here, um, these kind of groups of people are organized and with a, a, new, a new kind of, uh, of weapon We say uh, that are social media, and this is something quite different for the for the institutional media um, printed uh, classical media, because uh, social media uh, have a, a different kind of perspective, and the, the general opinion that is expressed on social media is of course quite um, not the same that uh, what could, what could say the majority of the people. So this this kind of uh, this kind of organizations. Uh, targeting uh, sometimes uh, journalists or cartoonists for their views, cartoons, and or anything. Um, it, it, it's 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 a new um, thing that they have to include in their uh, in their uh, state of mind and in their work. Je vais vous donner un exemple tout récemment. Le journal Le Monde. Publie, publiait euh, depuis des années une, une, une série qui s'appelle les, les, les indégivrables euh, d'un dessinateur euh, d'un dessinateur qui s'appelle Xavier Gors et euh, il y a eu alors là je sais pas si je sais pas si vous avez suivi cette actualité mais il y a eu une affaire euh, une affaire de, 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 de pédocriminalité et d'inceste euh, qui a impliqué euh, le, le directeur, euh, un, enfin un, 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 des ex, euh, un des ex, directeurs de, de Sciences Po. Euh, wow. Voilà. <laughs> if, even, even if we don't speak French, when we hear pedo criminality, we, we, we think it cannot voilà. be good. <laughs> donc, donc, euh, donc, donc, je ne je, je vais pas vous résumer cette affaire parce que c'est yeah. hors sujet. Mmh. Euh, simplement, donc, euh, Xavier Gors euh, a fait dans, dans le cadre de cette série qui met en scène euh, deux pingouins qui sont en train de, qui sont en train de débattre d'un sujet euh, d'actualité, euh, à, traiter, à traiter, comme il l'a toujours traité, et de manière totalement, euh, totalement ironique, euh, ce, ce sujet. Euh, le monde a été, euh, a été assailli de messages sur les réseaux sociaux, euh, de, euh, accusant euh, l'accusant la, de faire la promotion de la pédocriminalité, de ce qui n'était absolument pas le cas évidemment. Euh, simplement le ton, le ton du, le ton du, 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 du dessin de presse, le, le, le cartoon, c'est ironique, comme comme l'a dit Daryl, euh, un, un dessinateur, il, il tape sur la tête du lecteur, euh, il le secoue. Euh, donc, euh, donc le monde, le monde n'a pas, euh, pas supprimé le dessin, mais s'est excusé euh, auprès de ses lecteurs, en imaginant au fond que euh, tous, ces, tous ces messages euh, représentaient la, la, la majorité de son lectorat, ce qui n'était évidemment pas le cas, puisque c'était le fait tout simplement de, 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 de ce qu'on appelle des, euh, euh, des, des trolls. 
Okay, let's let's translate. This is a great example. Uh, so this right? example, it's quite recent. It's about uh, Le Monde, which is the, the most famous newspaper in France, uh, general, um, quite neut neutral politically, politically speaking. So uh, Le Monde has on the front page since uh, many years uh, a, a series of cartoons uh, made by Xavier Gors, which is uh, one of the famous cartoonists in France, um, integrating uh, two penguins chit-chatting with different uh, subjects. And uh, so in France, we have a, a huge uh, pedo scandal, uh, yep. scandal which mm -hmm. involved the head of the most famous political science school in France. So of course he, he resigned, but that, that's not the thing. And um, and so the the this cartoon was uh, talking about this 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 uh, horrible uh, horrible issue, um, and so yeah, two, two penguins chit chatting, and of course it's ironic, but um, there was a, a huge debate about uh, is it uh, the incest or is it pedocriminality? What's the, what's the stance? What's the difference between one and the other? Because there was not a biological uh, links between uh, the uh, the accused and uh, and uh, and the person what who accused him, so. Um, the, um, the, the, the Le Monde received a lot of complaints and they finally uh, apologized and um, broke off the links with, uh, with this cartoonist who finally resigned um, just because uh, they think that uh, some of the complaints they received on social media was the, was the general thinking of all their uh, of all their uh, readers. readers of all their readers so yes. they, they, they made a huge reaction and and of course it just it just get it just it just gets worse because um, there is no the debate about should should they have to apologize or should they have to re, 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 retract themselves? So that's right. that's, that's, that's well, one well, of the this, things. this is this is the kind of thing the New York Times has been under um, mm -hmm. lots of pressure, and this is the example that I brought up when we at the opening of this conversation about James Bennett losing his job. Um, so I this is this is the question of sort of what is the impact of these social media campaigns. Um, Danielle, let me let me ask you. You run. You just came from running the the Root newsroom. You're now running the Huff Post newsroom. Um, what what are the pressures that come to bear? And, and do you think uh, I'd love you to hear your your take on sort of what happened at the New York Times and whether that is a a concerning trend or what's happening at Le Monde? You know, the most prominent French paper that is ch choosing to apologize over a cartoon that 10 years ago would have just been a, a, a cartoon that some people liked and some people didn't like, and that's the nature of opinions. I think it's important, you know, as a leader in a newsroom to be able to discern when public outcry, you know, m m meets the level of where you actually need to like make a real measured response about it. The reality is, is that people always felt strongly about these things. The difference is it was very aggressive to actually pick up a phone and call somebody or actually mail a letter you know, to your newspaper or to any publication about how you felt about something they did. Now it's really quick and easy. You can just fire off a tweet, you can do it anonymously, you can leave a comment on a page and it can just snowball and become a thing that's even bigger than you ever would have anticipated. And that, that's why it feels so different from in the past like these people, people have always had these opinions. They just didn't necessarily have the, have the access to be able to express them so easily and abundantly and coordinate around them so easily. So I think it's important, again, to know the difference of what you're up against. Like if you're dealing with legitimate criticism where you've made a mistake and now you have to correct it, then of course you should address it um, and be honest and forthright with people about, you know, what changes you're going to make or put in place to avoid you know, a mistake like that happening again. But if you feel that you are being unfairly besieged, you know, like if it's where you're just basically just being railroaded by a group of people who just don't like your opinion, you have to decide, are you going to just weather the storm and stand up to that? Or are you going to just succumb to the will of, of the masses, even though it's something you don't actually believe in? Like you don't agree with these people who are coming after you. So you really have to decide where you're going to stand your ground ultimately on these issues. Susie? Yeah, I mean, I think, look, even this conversation has been so wide ranging, right? So, you know, I think when we when we talk about governments suppressing free speech, that isn't the same thing as cancel culture, right? That's not the same thing as Gannett deciding they don't wanna have transphobic cartoons, right? So I think 
like the the thing to really think about in terms of how we deal with these issues is sometimes you know there's going to be noise and part of our our job is to uh, sort of encourage conversation and sometimes difficult conversation. But if it feels like the criticism is valid, if, you know, a year or two ago, someone might have published a transphobic cartoon they're not going to publish now because they think twice, that's not a bad result, right? So like everything else, there's sort of like kernels in this that are good, that sort of force people to think more before they act and speak and write, that sort of force us to ask ourselves what our internal biases are and whether or not we're sort of being um, casually uh, dismissive of someone who doesn't deserve that. And then there's this other thing that happens, which is the people aren't allowed any grace, right? So if you use the example that you used in the introduction of the woman who got the editor position at Teen Vogue. Right, and Alexi McCammond, right. Alexi, mm -hmm. and then she had apologized. You know, I think there were valid concerns about, you know, she was taking on the job of an, edit of an editor of a teen magazine. And so the fact that she had made those comments when she was a teenager sort of were more um, relevant than they might have been for someone else, right? So, so it's complicated, but the question then sort of became like, was there any room for grace for her? Is there any scenario where she could have apologized enough or done it in a way that kind of satisfied this sense that she had behaved inappropriately? And I think that's what we don't have really room for, that because the conversations become so flattened, we don't really have a relative scale, right? We don't have the sense of this person, like Harvey Weinstein is a monster. He's not being canceled, he's a monster. And you know, this person said something on social media I don't like, and so I want them to apologize for it, right? There's like this sort of huge breadth of ways we talk about this, and I think that's actually doing a disservice to people who do actually want you know, some accountability when things are not well framed, right? Mm -hmm. well, I, I love I'd point. like to jump in because ahead, you brought Darryl. up yeah. the New York Times. Uh, editorial yeah. cartoonists are, uh, don't like the New York Times. They're a great example of outrageous overreaction and counterculture, uh, cancel culture. Um, so the New York Times had a low-level editor make a, a poor decision to print an anti-Semitic cartoon in the international edition of the New York Times. And they got deserved blowback for that. And in response to that, they decided to make a policy of never ever printing an editorial again in any of their publications, uh, an editorial cartoon again, um, which is a crazy, crazy overreaction. You know, they've made stupid decisions about words they shouldn't have printed in the past. They haven't decided to stop printing words. I would much prefer that they stop printing words and print cartoons instead that would, leave a much more balanced publication. So they don't publish the editor and they kick out every darn cartoonist. And at the same time, you know, they were hosting a, an international cartoon syndicate um, and they kicked that syndicate out on their ear because they wanted nothing to do with editorial cartoons ever again. And that syndicate had a, a, a very tough time trying to keep their business going after uh, uh, losing their method of distribution. Um, you know, so, so hang on. There I, is, I, finish your thought, and then yeah, go ahead. Well, there's there is, uh, you know, you guys were talking about uh, measured response to these things. A, a large problem is that these responses often are not measured. Often they are just crazy, and the New York Times is a perfect example of crazy. Well, well, so this is what I wanted to get to because, um, like, I would like Danielle and some and people of her. Um, let's say spine be the people who are in charge of all of our media publications. But unfortunately, we know that institutions are tend to be cowardly, <laughs> actually, and they 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 will cave to protect the institution. I used to work at the New York Times, and I felt that was one of the most important things that I learned when I worked there. Is that thinking that I was working at the beacon of uh, free expression, 
and accountability to government and public officials, what I what I discovered working inside the beast is that it's actually an institution like every other institution. It's an important institution. I cherish it and I revere it, but it it behaves like an institution. And so when institutions are under threat, and Charlie Hebdo, I think, is quite a an interesting um, outlier in that it continues that Charlie Hebdo continues to do the work because maybe you guys are contrarian by nature, um, even in the wake of a massacre of that kind. But institutions are fearful and cowardly, as Daryl's experience with the people just choosing not to publish the Trump cartoons to avoid, you know, the hassle of readers attack, you know, uh, is one thing. And then on the other hand, um, my experience as an editor of a newsroom is that the journalists in the newsroom themselves are also, not everyone is as strong and able to sort of say, well, that's just an opinion and too bad. And, you know, this is my reporting and that they start pulling their punches. So I'd love to hear anybody or, or cartoonists start pulling their punches, for, for example. I just would love to hear from any of you uh, as to th that th those ripple effects of the atmosphere in general. You know, I just feel like criticism of all kinds, whether warranted or not warranted, is part of the price of admission of being someone who speaks out publicly and has an opinion. Um, you have to be able to know the difference to, or be able to discern when the criticism is legitimate and you should do something about it. And when it's simply, as Susie said, just noise. Cause there's always noise on the internet. There's always people complaining about something. There's always going to be individuals who feel they have been wronged somehow by popular culture or the media or et cetera, et cetera. So you, it, to me, it's silly. Like if you're an institution like the New York Times that's been around for hundreds of years and you're just afraid of like people like not liking Trump cartoons because you want to, I don't, I don't, I don't understand that. Like that doesn't make sense to me. Like I get, I mean, like the criticism, yes, might hurt your feelings. Like, oh, they accuse you of having a, you know, a certain bent one way or the other, but that shouldn't like stop you from speaking truth to power and standing up against those who, um, seek to uh, you know wrong and abuse people through the power that they have so it's just i mean i don't know like maybe like i don't know if the fact my own personal experience with hate mail and harassment has just made me like not as sensitive <laughs> to these particular issues but um to me it all has to be put in perspective there's a big difference between a, just a bunch of people complaining and legitimate criticism well, and also I think the issue with the New York Times is that they're so reactive, like it, it feel, and also really varied in their responses. So someone will do something and they will come down really hard on that person. Someone else will do something that seems worse. They'll be like totally fine with that thing. Like it feels part, like the part of the problem with the New York Times is that the, the sort of culture is shifting around them. And like any sort of big organization that's, not very used to change. They're just struggling to know what the right re reaction is. And so they're just making different different reactions each time and it satisfies no one and it leaves the newsroom feeling like they don't know what they're supposed to kind of do or not do, right? The, the decision to just eliminate editorial cartoons because you don't like one of them is just like a super reactive um, sign that you, you're not really thinking things through clearly. You're just trying to like, you know, sort of put your finger into the, the hole as it opens up and hope that that's like enough, right? And I think that's, you know, if for an institution like the Times, they need to take a step back and ask themselves why they can't just come up with like a clear sense of policies around what they want in their newsroom. It, it, it seems confusing that it's been such like a mess for the last year or so. Yeah, because it's like, it should start at, at up top. Like if you are in charge of the publication, you should set the tone about how we're going to approach these issues. If you truly believe in democracy, the First Amendment, um, having these conversations that are sometimes really difficult, you should you should stand behind what you what you put out there. And if you can't stand behind what you put out there, then what are we what are we even doing? You know. I, I know, but I do think you, that you're hitting on one of the most um, uh, important 
parts of how cancel culture, as we're defining it, is impacting media journalism and the journalistic institutions that keep our societies, you know, hold them to account, hold hold people to account, which is, I think that it is now being led by the, the warp and woof of social media, uh, waves of outrage you know i think that's the dan that's the danger that i see because mm -hmm. that we're, we are seeing some of those effects i mean the idea that le monde le monde is you know the 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 equivalent of the new york times in france and that if le monde is also is what gerard's describing is the same kind of thing is like they're wavering on something pretty core right gerard yes and um, i think uh, I Thank you. To, Your sorry. English is great. Yes, we encourage you and we I support think, you. I, thank you. It's also much better than my French, if that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, I think that the the the, the story of this, this fact about the New York Times uh, is is linked to the very nature of uh, of cartoon, because cartoon means trouble. And uh, I, I don't think that Daryl will will be. I think that Daryl will be agree with me uh, uh, to draw to draw a cartoon and a political cartoon uh, is generally uh, you will have troubles with that uh, in in one way or or another because because. Uh, the, the the cartoon is uh, is uh, often uh, violent. Uh, it often uh, touches uh, things that uh, people are are very um, very uh, uh, linked with. So uh, I think that the, the, the me the New York Times doesn't want troubles anymore. And that's um, that's very. Uh, uh, it's a problem to me for uh, for such an institution, and it's it's a problem for journalism, generally, not only for cartoons. If I if I uh, if today I I, I was a, a journalist, I'm not cartoonist. I'm journalist. Uh, if I was a journalist uh, working uh, for the New York Times, I would be uh, worried about my job. Yeah, I, I think that we've really, um, w w what we're seeing is, I, I, I'm seeing it on the ground. I've, I've said this uh, in private conversations to, to, to each of you when I've spoken to you. Um, and it does concern me because, you have to you you have to be tough to be a journalist. You have to be willing to take criticism. You have to let that roll off you. If you're not sure where your leadership feels, if you're not sure, uh, it, it, then you're going to be let. Then you're going to be led by you know. I'm, I, I hate to use the word the mob, but sometimes it feels like the mob uh, on social media when when it's coming at you. And I, you know, certainly I've had it come after me. It just no matter how you know fearless you want to be it just doesn't you can't you're human right you just can't help but feel assaulted in some way and of course danielle a thousand percent right it's nothing like the real life violence that um people who experience racism have gone through now and for so long and too long in the past um which is not the fault of journalists. It doesn't mean that social media coming after you feels feels great. <laughs> yeah, totally. Like it doesn't feel good, you know, to deal with um, when people are upset with you because you've like given your opinion and it, the opinion, like for whatever reason. Well, or even if you like, haven't, you know, we all know how it works. Yeah, like like it, it, may, it may be something. You, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and like, someone just took issue with the headline and didn't even bother to read anything that you actually wrote. Um, but it's like, are you going to ride the wave of people's emotions on social media? Or are you going to focus on, you know, delivering information, which is your job? Like, you can't, like, I honestly feel like, you know, some journalists, like, I know people are encouraged to be on social media. Like, I'd be fine with, you know, if any one of my staff just decided, like, hey, I don't want to be on Twitter anymore. It's an awful place. I'd be like, cool. That's why I barely really. Tweet. 
Really? That's why I most of my that. tweets are about I working out. That. Yeah. <laughs> They're I mean, not about politics. Because I think like, you know, Danielle and I have worked together. It's like, it's really important to remember that Twitter is not real life, right? It's like, it's sort of the point that Gerard was making about Le Monde. It's like the loudest people don't necessarily reflect your entire readership, right? So part of it is just, you have to decide as a leader what you believe and what your organization stands for. And then you have to stick to that. You can't just decide week by week whether or not you're like worried about what Twitter thinks. Like that's just not gonna work. <laughs> There's nowhere to live. Yeah, no. but it is a, it is a it is a, a balancing act because you know you also don't want to be unresponsive to your readers. You want to be listening to them, and it's just but it tends to be the loudest. Before we wrap, I just want to ask one one question to to Gerard, and that I'll then I'll also bounce to to all of you. H have you seen a a diminishing in the in the sort of young people who want to become cartoonists in the wake of uh, what happened to Charlie Hebdo? Is there just a diminished um, enthusiasm or a fear that holds people back from wanting to pursue that as a career? No, no, um, because uh, it's, it's, it's always been difficult to find a uh, press cartoonist uh, in France. Uh, everyone wants to do um, uh, Cartoon, uh, cartoon, cartoon, like, uh, like uh, superheroes or uh, right. to, to, to write this kind of stories, you know, to, to draw this kind of stories. And uh, the, what we call in, in France press cartooning is uh, it's always been, uh, it, it's always been, it, it always been difficult to find, uh, above all in, in Charlie Hebdo, uh, which are which is um, a, a media uh, which is a, a newspaper uh, where cartoonists are are not just uh, put away uh, it, they, they have the, their own uh, their own uh, space there there are real journalists uh, also they're, they're not for sure so so uh, no, we 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 found new 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 cartoonists, young cartoonists uh, since uh, since uh, two, two, 2015. 2015. 2015. Uh, and uh, we're they're good. <laughs> they're good. <laughs> so, well, that's um, that's an that's an encouraging note for us to wrap on. That there are still young people who are willing to get out there and and speak their mind and tell the truth. Um, and I think it's just going to be an evolving conversation, of understanding how to respond to these um, waves of pressure and influence and what we call cancel culture. However, um, that definition continues <laughs> to to uh, shift and shift and change. Thank you so much, Danielle, Susie, Daryl, uh, Gerard, especially all the way from Paris. Thank you so much for this fascinating conversation. And um we, we appreciate your thoughts and um, caring about what's happening to journalism in the world. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. Thank you for having us.